So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Pativity and Robert Half Collaboration Forum. My name is Paul Middleton, and I'm joined here today by my colleagues from Pativity and our sister company, Robert Half. This is our this is our weekly collaboration forum, and this is the penultimate week of our fifth series. And it's great to see you all here. Some familiar faces on the screen, as well as some new faces. Since March of last year, this weekly forum has been aiming to invigorate, challenge and inspire us all to be bold, to look beyond our computer screens and to stand up and think differently, as well as bring optimism in what has been for so many a time of disruption, uncertainty and change. Over the months, our forum has become a place for today's business leaders, as well as our leaders of tomorrow, to talk to each other, learn from each other, challenge each other and gain confidence from each other's perspectives and experiences. And that aim is the same today as it's always been. This is your forum. It's not a closed forum. You're not muted and it's pretty informal. And I urge you all to get involved, make your voice heard or at least make your comments seen in the chat. A thread that we a thread that's run through all of our forums is that now is the time to think differently and to be actioning both those big and small ideas. Put differently, we believe at Prativity and at Robert Half that if we don't proactively drive change during this continued period of disruption, we run the risk of rapidly becoming irrelevant and falling behind the pack. But despite the delay of lockdown easing here in the UK, there's still another danger lurking, and that's the risk associated with our desire to unlock and our frustration there. And as we go in and spend more time face to face with our colleagues and move out of our home offices and we dust off our office desks, and that danger is that we sleepwalk back into our old working habits and we leave behind our COVID mindset, a mindset that's given us new found ability to drive change at a rate we previously thought impossible, to achieve things we were told not could be done and to be able to overcome barriers that had previously seemed unscalable. In other words, over the last 14 months, we've successfully broken an office-based nine to five working pattern that's been with us since the Industrial Revolution. Our challenge to all of you in this forum is not to march backwards and fall into those old habits as you go back to the office and lose everything that we've achieved. Because if we do, you can be sure that others won't and we'll all simply fall behind. Instead, the aim of this forum is to encourage you to be bold and imagine what the future can be and how you can grasp it. And that's what we've been doing here week on week. We've already looked at the future of culture, the future of healthcare, the future of the economy, the future of social justice and inclusion, the future of ESG and the future of success. And next week, we'll be bringing all those threads together as we look at the future of work and the office. But this week, we are going to be talking about the future of technology and in particular, the future of artificial intelligence and the impact it can have on us, our businesses, our cities and society. Now, I'm guessing many of you may still view AI with a degree of scepticism and when you are encouraged to embrace it in your business and your lives. And our panelists today would love to change that mindset. And over the next hour, we'll be opening your eyes to the power of AI and how it is an imperative in the future of our workplace and in your lives in general. So I'm delighted to introduce, uh, introduce Aisha Khanna, who is our panelist this week. Aisha is co-founder and CEO of Addo AI, an artificial intelligence solutions firm and incubator. And she's been a strategic advisor on artificial intelligence, smart cities and fintech to leading global corporations and governments. Aisha also serves on the board, this, on the board of the Singapore government's agency that develops its world-class technology sector to drive the country's digital economy and power its smart nation vision. In 2017, Addo AI, Aisha's company, was featured in Forbes magazine as one of four leading artificial intelligence companies in Asia, and Aisha was named one of Southeast Asia's groundbreaking female entrepreneurs by Forbes magazine in 2018. She's also founder of 21st Century Girls, a charity that delivers free coding and artificial intelligence classes to girls in Singapore, and founded the Empower AI for Singapore National Movement, which aims to teach all youth in the country the basics of artificial intelligence. Like most weeks, we have tried to take on the big topics and the topics that we think are important to you. We probably won't be able to cover every aspect of AI in one hour, it's a big topic, but we'll take some bite-sized chunks and go in the directions that you, our attendees, take us. So the more you get involved, the more relevant this session will be to you. Yes, sir. So, Without further ado, 
Um, Aisha, you're the author of the book Hybrid Reality. Can you tell us what that means and why you think the concept of hybrid reality is more important than ever for us to understand, please? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. I'm really pleased to be speaking to you. Um, I think that the whole concept of hybrid reality was based on the evolution of human beings in our society. So we had the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and then the information revolution, which is what we all are. We're all knowledge workers, and we are using our own digital skills and other kinds of skills and working with um, each other globally. But there is a new team member, a new entity that's going to start living amongst us. And that is the artificial intelligence that resides in either machines or it resides in robots or it resides in chatbots or it's in the very laptops and phones that we're using. And it's going to be pervasive. It's everywhere. Oh, sorry, Aisha, just one second. I think you've been muted because um, I think there was some background noise. So you just might take yourself off mute, Aisha. Yes, I just. There you go. You're back on. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so um, so basically the idea of hybrid reality is it's a new era in the evolution of our species, because now we have to live with technology. We have to live with it in a way that it will be at our workplace, it will be in our home, it will be in our cities. And we have to have some kind of relationship with it that is productive and that in which we have agency, in which we are not passive consumers of what it's saying, but that we're using it to benefit ourselves. And I always say it is the age where we should stand on the shoulders of machines to amplify our own potential. Thank you, Aisha. So we're going to be looking at a few topics today, I think. We're going to be looking at the ideas of like smart cities, the future yes. of business, um, and digging into what that means from us from a, a business perspective as well as a societal perspective as well. But maybe if we start off with the concept of cities, which is one that you touched on, mm. what do you think the future of smart cities will look like? And in the context of today, how will they be more resilient to pandemics like COVID-19 through the use of artificial intelligence? Well, the idea of the smart city has actually been around for decades, but it is only now that cities are beginning to lay down the digital infrastructure that will make it more convenient for citizens to live in any city. And the whole point of the smart city is that all the services that a city is supposed to provide us, whether it is transportation, energy, security, education, healthcare, all of this should be seamless, should be efficient, should be personalized, and should be free uh, or, or very cheap. So how can artificial intelligence help with that? Well, think about the fact that um, just about healthcare, for example. Uh, you know, we are now in a situation where Technology is helping bring down the cost of healthcare in smart cities. And the way it does this is evident from an example of the handheld ultrasound. So, better Butterfly Q, if you wanted an ultrasound in case you had, God forbid, a tumor, or if you were pregnant and wanted to go to the hospital, you would go to a hospital or a clinic, you would lie on a bed, and there's this ultrasound machine. And then the doctor kind of, you know, checks your body. But now there is a handheld ultrasound that you can plug into your iPhone and hold it in your hand. And any nurse's assistant can actually drive over or cycle over to you, or you could go just in your neighborhood 15 minutes away to a quasi clinic. And the artificial intelligence will kind of identify any issues. And using the 5G network, your doctor could be dialing in. He could be a specialist from London, from Frankfurt, from anywhere in the world. And this notion that you don't need a huge hospital with huge machines because devices are shrinking. Devices are not only shrinking, they're becoming more intelligent. Prognosis and diagnosis are becoming more intelligent. And that the best talent, wherever it is in the world, can be available to you. And because they don't need to travel, their cost also goes down. This is a very clear example of a smart healthcare system. 
On top of that, if you started adding things like, well, now the healthcare system uh, protecting the privacy of all your data now knows a lot about you as well. Now, if it does that, it can immediately personalize some therapies for you. This is an entirely new industry called digital therapeutics. You know, imagine that you, did you know that if you have a heart attack, a lot of people actually ha have issues and go back to the hospital. It's a significant enough number that there's a real move, especially in the U.S., to reduce this uh, kind of return to the hospital because it's so high cost for the insurance companies, for the patients, for the hospital. And the way they're trying to do this now is with a company called Bioformis, mm -hmm. in which it automatically, using its wearable watch, automatically can detect when you're going to start having heart problems again. And get this it can automatically adjust your heart medicine without even needing a doctor. And this is called digital therapeutics, and it immediately means your healthcare is more real-time, more dynamic, more personalized, and cheaper. So that's just one example. Um, another example, I'll give you one more, is that the smart city is also a place which is sustainable, where quality of life matters, right? I think the smart city is not a rich city necessarily. It has one focus, the citizen, the citizen's happiness, the citizen's health, the citizen uh, have, having a productive time and not wasting time in commute. So in Singapore, we want to reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to have more autonomous vehicles. But for two years, actually for three years now, we have been working with Volocopter which is a drone taxi. It's basically uh, electric and it, uh, it can seat two people. And uh, we have been running a lot of pilots with it. And within two years, for some of our districts, we will be now having drone taxis. So they won't be as super fast and jazzy as we see in the movies, but they will be in the sky and they will have much lower emissions as well. So a smart city, you know, kind of really, even though it, it shouldn't appear very high tech. If you look at people, but actually they're underpinned with endless amounts of technology. Thank you, Aisha. Your, um, your screen's a little pixelated. I mean, I'm just wondering if you might oh. be worth turning your camera off and on just to just to see if that okay. fixes it. But um, uh, okay. while, it, what, while you're doing that, let me just ask you a question about so you mentioned about Singapore and you mentioned about, you know, obviously how uh, given healthcare, it can become more real time, dynamic, cheaper, and then the sustainable angle as well. Just just give us a perspective from Singapore. Have you seen over the last 14 months during which we've been in a pandemic, has the pace of change and disruption caused by, by AI increased? Maybe kind of looking at Singapore as an example. Have you seen real energy put into that and that COVID mindset that we discussed kind of coming to the fore? Yes, it, in fact, it's not only in Singapore, we've seen it everywhere. So if you look at startups, they're all turning more towards AI now. And remember, they're turning to AI also because Singapore is a rapidly aging country, like many countries in Europe, um, and it we just don't have enough people to fill some, many of the jobs that we need. For example, there is a company called Caro, and it sells secondhand cars. It's very popular, it's expanding, it's just a unicorn, just raised $350 million. Um, you know, instead of having mechanics check the cars, it actually has AI check with computer vision and IoT, kind of, if there are any kinds of issues with the car at all. And the whole experience, buying experience, is completely contactless. You can go in, you can look at the car, real time, the robot will show you the car, it will check for defects, it will tell you where it's parked, you can go and open it with a QR code, you can sit in it, you can drive in it, you can put it back, and there's a chat bot throughout the journey kind of answering your question. Um, and this is just uh, one example. We've seen with e-commerce, uh, there's been a huge explosion of logistics and all kinds of other optimization using artificial intelligence as people have many more digital engagements. Um, oh, I think I, I should. Singapore. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, we lost you again. But uh, no, no, do carry on. Oh, Lena, let me. Okay. 
Um, can you hear me now? You can hear you now, yeah. Okay, yeah, please let me know if you can't. The other thing is that while the corporations are galloping ahead, and we, you know, also advise many of these clients, the government is watching. And the government is setting up guidelines for AI. I am on the AI and Ethics Steering Committee for the government. It's looking at data protection. What I like about Singapore is it always looks at every technology in a very balanced manner. So yes, great, lots of benefits, but we must make sure that we're mitigating and controlling the downsides. And that's really what a smart city is supposed to do, not be some naive, like happy-go-lucky, I love technology place, but one at which technology is used to enhance people's lives and to protect their rights as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that concept of technology being in harmony with people's lives and enhancing will absolutely be there. And I think it's, in, I mean, you've mentioned a few business examples there and Kelvin, I think, posted in the chat around and you can use this example as well. It's uh, it's around how AI um, has been used in the UK to predict blockages in drains. Not quite so glamorous yeah. as some of the examples you gave, but it, but it helps discharge sewage discharge into waterways and so on. I think Kelvin's put a link in there as well. Um, so no, that's great. Um, a question from someone in the forum. What what would your advice be to businesses people in order to have a productive relationship mm. with it with AI? And maybe you know as we start to look at how. AI affects our day to day business life. That's a good starting point because because, as I mentioned, many people are nervous about AI. So how would you how would you ask people to look at that? So we can divide ourselves into two roles. One is that of a consumer and one is that of uh, a worker. And, and in both the cases, we have are constantly interacting with AI. So first of all, as a consumer, where we are continually getting nudges and recommendations and downloading apps and talking to Alexa, these machines are gathering a lot of contextual information about us. For example, um, Alexa has an app, Amazon has an app called Halo. And Halo can look at 18 features of your voice. So I'm speaking to you right now, you look happy, I look happy, but as we're talking, Alexa can pick up, uh, you know, are you skeptical about what I'm saying? Or am I happy? Am I worried about something else? And it's all like interesting and creepy and useful at the same time. And we have to, first of all, know that it's doing this. So Apple and other companies are already putting, if you put something on the app store and actually tells you, what is the data that it's taking from you and potentially selling? So to have agency, we have a responsibility to be a little bit like AI activists that are pushing for more transparency on how that data is being used. And the European Union has uh, really good policies around that where you continue to ask people if they're okay with this data being taken, they have the right to be deleted. Uh, we have to continue to push for this and we need to always Think who owns the AI, because the AI doesn't work on its own. It has an owner. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, we also have to teach our children who don't, who are not mature like us about a checklist of what to think about when they're uh, interacting with apps and other machines. The second thing that's important is when we are workers, right? So now we have this threat. Uh, some people feel like AI is able to, if you're a lawyer, it's able to check a lot of the contracts. Yes, they were, that was grunt work, that was a routine, but, but it was part of your job. So people, this, this elimination of certain routine tasks seems to be causing stress, but it really shouldn't. Because what you should think of AI is not as a competitor, but as an assistant. The moment we change our perspective and think of it as an assistant that is freeing up our time, we can actually uh, evolve ourselves into the reason we went to college in the first place, which was to work on interesting problems and interesting things. And there's a huge demand, uh, and we advise many, many companies across the world for people who are comfortable and comfortable using and leveraging data and analytics and AI. Um, and there's actually their careers, I would say, their jobs are more secure than ever 
rather than those that will be resisting it in fear. So that I think is, is the critical thing. Just think of it as your little assistant, uh, which can never replace you, but will make your life easier and easier over time. And again, just, just digging into that easier over time point, that, that last point you made, it's interesting. There's a couple of comments in the chat mm -hmm. where there is a, um, a reflection that, is there a danger of AI learning from our bad behavior? So for example, Roland highlights how mm. if, if autonomous cars watch our behavior of tailgating and cutting each other off, or indeed um, Victoria's making the point of AI learning from poor online behavior. Do you think, you know, how do you, when you look at AI and understand AI, how do we guard against that? This is an excellent question. And you know what, this happened. Microsoft had this chatbot called K. And uh, after a little while, it became completely racist and horrible, and they had to discontinue it because they were letting it learn from all the Twitter, Twitterati that it was exchanging notes with. So this is the responsibility of companies. This means that we have two things. One, we check the data that the AI is being trained on to make sure it's not biased because the AI like, needs the data from somewhere. We don't just let it go and get data from wherever it wants. And there are fairness metrics and bias statistics that you can check. You should do some exploratory data analysis and then run those statistics on your, uh, on your data. The second is, uh, you know, bias is obvious because it shows there's one class more heavily represented than another. But then there are certain things that you say, well, you know, this is not acceptable to me, even if it, if even it is in the data, this is not the personality or the values that I want my AI to have or our company's AI to have. And that, again, no AI can decide. That's a very human decision taken by a company, by a country together. And for that, we that's the reason why in Singapore we have, are starting next year a certification in AI ethics for the product manager. The product manager is the person who's head of the design of the whole product. And that person must ask the right questions from his or her leadership and team at multiple points to make sure that it is true to the values of that company. And, and I hope, of course, that the values are those that align with basic and you know good morals in society. Absolutely. So that so that human oversight is critical. I know someone's mentioned the chat around whether that's censorship, but you're saying that 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 oversight of AI is going to be is is going to be key. Now, let's maybe look at dig into a little bit more about how how AI can impact our day to day lives in business. And we've got a range of people from different industries, and yeah. different businesses within this forum. And let's just start with I mean, do you do you do you see businesses being bold and imaginative enough, particularly during the last fourteen months, in their use and application of AI? I most certainly do. When I first started this company, a lot of people used to think that AI was something, you know, magical or interesting. Uh, they weren't very serious about it, or they would have little pilot projects they wanted to do, which was just um, interesting and innovative. But now it's very different. Now they want the data platform that will fuel not just one pilot, but hundreds of use cases. Um, and there are three main types of use cases you have, right? One is automation. Hands down, more and more companies are saying, we want to automate. We worked with a large telecommunications company, and it told us that they were getting complaints from their enterprise users because they were unable to resolve issues quickly enough. And it also came out of the newspaper. It was kind of embarrassing for them. So what we did was we went to their call center and we said all the emails coming in, uh, you know, we're going to let the AI classify them automatically into different categories, whether it's um, a cable issue or some other kind of outage. Then we're going to look at the history of how such problems were resolved. And we're even going to do a root cause analysis. Then we are going to look at all the engineers that went and were particularly good at solving a problem, and we're going to assign those engineers to it. And when those engineers are there, we're going to look at the logs of the people, how they've done it in the past, to be an assistant to the engineer and recommend certain steps he should take. Now, this reduced their um, labor cost by 30%. It reduced their time to resolution by 40%. And human error, which used to occur as well, was virtually eliminated. 
Um, and this is, you know, measurable ways of improving the customer centricity of a company. Remember, at the end of the day, the company is not trying so much or shouldn't be to reduce its cost just for the sake of it, but to improve its customer processes. And when you do look at it that way, then the people who were doing these jobs and are no longer needed can move on to other things. So there is some redundancy that happens, but usually it's not of the people who are able to create more value on top of it. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 sorry, please continue. No, I was just going to say the other two things are optimization and innovation, and, and we can talk about that later, but there are you know, three kind of main things that you can do with AI for businesses that consistently, especially if you do optimization, for example, you're saying, look, especially in manufacturing, oil and gas, chemical plants, you have the same number of inputs, but now you have more output. So how did that happen, right? So you basically, uh, there was a chemical plant in, in Spain where they trained the AI uh, to evaluate how the same number of inputs could lead to more output. And it did that by looking at 3,000 different variables, like humidity, speed of certain like machines rotating, et cetera. And every 15 minutes, it would change the parameters. And they were able to increase their annual output by 2.5%, which is huge for an oil and gas company. So I think this is, um, you know, what we're really seeing. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm just gonna take one second. So basically what we're seeing over here is that um, this is um, the ability of AI to significantly improve the output without having to spend any other money. And we see this in optimization, logistics, optimization, everything else. So that's very powerful for companies. And now, I haven't even started on the innovation potential, which we can do it. I will do later. Oh, it's the dog. I like that yeah. one comment. It's, the dog is real. <laughs> it's all good. We had pets at home on last week, so it's all good. It's perfectly good. It's uh, so. <laughs> closing the door. Um, <laughs> so, so I, so I should, as you say, we'll dig more into the concepts of automation, yeah. optimization, innovation. But, but again, for many people on this phone, they're in big businesses or small businesses. <clears throat> And, and, and AI is on the fringes. You know, they see it, yeah. they see the pieces of it, they see it talked about, they see groups that are called uh, AI or innovation that have the responsibility of looking to implement it. But how do you think that companies should start their AI journey? When they, when yeah, they have so much, it's kind of on the fringes. This is something that a lot of companies uh, have a misconception about. They tend to think that, they tend to think either that it's just a pilot that they need to do, or they think that it's very expensive. And one thing they are right about, they often don't have the right skill set. So the way to do it is, the first thing is, you kind of have to think about the problems you're trying to solve. So you get a group of people who are one or two AI engineers or advisors, and there are many out there, firms that help with this. You sit with them, and you identify your problems or your challenges. Or you can say, hey, that company's our competitor. I really like what they're doing. I wanna be at that point. Or that's not even in the same industry, but I like what they're doing. I wanna try that. Once we prioritize the business vision, then we can help spur that business vision by saying, well, you know, AI could help with this. AI could do this for you. But then the third step is you have to check the, whether they have the data or not to achieve that. And that is something that 99% um, of companies do not have perfect data. So when we go back and we sometimes tell them, you know, actually you wanted to do this, but it's not possible right now, they, they feel really disappointed. So don't be disappointed. You may not have the data for all your most fabulous use cases, but in the beginning, choose something that's doable. And the important thing is to do it only in three months. It should always be agile. It should be done on the cloud. Um, it should be done in a way that can be expanded. So the same data is not only used for that one problem, but you should also think of three other problems that could solve. Um, and then after three months, you, you start testing it. Within four, four and a half months, you should know if it worked. And if it did, 
I will certainly get the budget for the next and the next. Remember, because you're building it correctly, it's not like you did one, then another one, then another one. You did one, then five, then 10, then 20. That's the way it goes, basically. Okay, kind of so exponentially increases the ability for you to do more with data. So you're basically saying you fail quickly, but you check your data, you have you time box it three months, use agile approaches, you use the cloud. Um, but but again, in practical terms, Aisha, you know, many many people here might be saying, okay, that, that sounds good. We can see the things that we should um we should automate. Where do we go with that? Do we look at crowdsourced AI? There's companies out there that offer the democratization of AI and things they can purchase from them. Where how how do you and they won't necessarily have those AI engineers or or innovators who sit there and can do that. How do they yeah. how do they start that? What what are the easiest things that people can bite off to start that journey? Well, you know, it's 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 very difficult if you don't have the talent. You can get it from three places. One, you can go to consulting firms um, such as ours. We we provide that. You guys provide that. The other thing is you can go for freelancers like TopTal. TopTal is pretty fantastic. It has good um, good engineers that are available on a part-time basis. The third is that you could actually try to see the same thing provided by some companies, by some platforms, like software as a service, for example, um, that would give you a taste of what's possible. You don't have to custom made your own AI. And especially, please do look at Google. Um, or uh, AWS or anything else. And you'll see that they all have the many, many of these libraries already there. Oh, sorry guys, I'm just gonna put it in. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I don't know where my kids are. No, that's all right. kids when you need them, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. So, so just to give people a flavor as well, which industry would you, and just reflecting on Gagan's question in the chat, which industry would you consider as the front runner in AI adoption and point towards and say, look, try, try and mimic what they're doing, um, you know, which, which has yes. the potential that we yeah. should try and emulate? Look, I would say that if you had to look at a few industries, uh, e-commerce is hands down doing an amazing job. So look at Amazon or uh, look at any company basically in Europe or others, how they have consistently used it. Uh, and you don't need to only think of the tech native companies. If you look at Walmart, they've also done a lot. So you can look at tr some traditional companies that have actually moved into the space. The other thing is financial services. Uh, you know, with these challenger banks, we see all the banks are really waking up and starting to incorporate this kind of stuff into their own companies. They are trying to put in more digital user experience. They are trying to make customer onboarding seamless. They are trying to provide digital credit cards and ability to do credit scoring. Um, this is really driven by the competitive landscape. Now, the third thing is um, you know, logistics and transportation. So if you would say financial services is the lifeblood of a city, the other is uh, logistics and transportation. And this is another area, not only in the self-driving cars, but I'm literally talking about people who deliver things all the time and are the supply chains. That's another huge area, not only interestingly for uh, supply chains for roads, but also for sea. Oh, no. um, again, these industries are pretty behind but they're now um, being being inspired by the rise in e-commerce to do that on all forums. And then finally, what's exciting is that with 5G, when you have Internet of Things, manufacturing, believe it or not, is a sector that's going to benefit the most. So it's the most behind right now. But the moment you have the smart factory, this is going to yield huge benefits for people, even small factories, as they automate um, and they put in robots and sensors and are able to improve the kind of their output and their efficiency and safety actually as well. It, Aisha, it sounds, I mean, it sounds inspiring and fantastic, but of course, in a, the innovation you talk of can be risky. And do, do, does the investment in AI really pay off for companies? Or you know, how do you see that investment into R&D? Is, is the majority of it succeeding? Is the majority of it failing? Um, and what, what's your view on that? Again, this is, this is important to realize. There are two types of AI investment that you can do. One is 
R&D, where you're trying to find kind of a, a new vaccine, for example, or you're trying to build a com something completely new. That is risky. That's why these are usually startups. Uh -huh. These are usually startups that uh, invest in this. They're usually startups and venture capital that puts the money in that. And there's an inherent risk in that. Uh, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. But here's where they almost always succeed, which is where I work, which is on existing businesses that are trying to automate and optimize and leverage their existing data. You really can't go wrong with this. I mean, unless the, the technology is there, it's affordable, it's scalable, um, the, it's been proven again and again that the investment in data science and analytics and AI uh, pays off for companies. They, they're able to uh, optimize their operations, cut their costs significantly. They're able to do things faster and better. The only thing that gets in the way of such projects is, frankly, people, culture, because there's a change culture required as well. So for enterprise, I would say it, it's almost always a win, but investment in absolutely new kinds of AI, and 99% of companies don't need to invent new AI. They need to actually work with what's out there and available libraries, software, et cetera, and use that. So I would highly encourage them to, to at least do the basics and take advantage of that. And you mentioned a couple of barriers that are, or challenges to navigate, which can be people and culture. From the work that you've done with your clients and what you see in the industry, how would you encourage others to navigate those challenges around people and culture to make them, to allow AI to have the most impact the most rapidly? This is a golden question, right? How do you have change management along with technology? So a lot of people set up the office of the chief data officer or they somebody double hats in a smaller organization. And that person's job is twofold. One is to educate and uh, bring together the business with the data and AI engineers. You really need to create a forum where they trust each other and start to work collaboratively with each other. That is, um, that takes time, that takes education. Wherever we are, we do so many workshops so that people can come together and understand what is even possible and understand that it's not a threat to them but could actually be useful to them. And when, after a while, people become comfortable, then they begin to really say, oh my God, you know, that's such a problem. If I could only didn't have this, it would be so much better or I've always wanted to do this. And that's when the juices start flowing. But you have to give it time, anywhere from three to six months of meetings and collaboration. And the second job of the chief data officer's office is to create the enabling infrastructure. This means that they, uh, after a while, it's kind of self-serve as well, because you want everybody to be able to log on to this platform and not necessarily always run AI, but see the dashboard, see real-time information, and um, get the data they need to make informed decisions, and so that they just get in this vibe of being a data-driven organization. And Aisha, you mentioned at the very top um, about how um, about the concept of, uh, of sustainable cities and that being a key factor in the use mm -hmm. of AI. We've, we've discussed a number of times in this forum about the importance of the ESG agenda, um, particularly and, and how that has accelerated over the last 14 or so months. Uh, how do you think AI can help companies achieve their environmental and social goals um, and accelerate those? Look, I mean, there, there are two ways. One could be to use this ESG framework and guidelines, but another one can be really just making some small commitments themselves. If you have a big real estate footprint, uh, you know, taking the time to put in a building information management system, it does require somebody to, to do that. Uh, if you have a, um, a desire to actually, if you have data centers that you're using, to choose the data centers and, uh, or if you're, or maybe move to the cloud so that you don't have such a heavy investment all the time, but are only using things on the go. Um, from a technology perspective, which is a department you know, in particular that I'm familiar with, there are lots of ways that you can actually contribute to reducing your carbon footprint. And as far as social impact is concerned, 
I think just making sure in the first place that you are using AI in a way that's ethical and is responsible and is transparent is in itself a huge social gift. Because nine out of 10 companies are not, nine, 9.9 .9 out of 10 companies are not even having that conversation right now. And that is also a social good. Apart from that, if you have the bandwidth in your company and you are able to um, you know, create kind of any kind of personalization tool, uh, personalized learning tool, for example, or anything else, there's so much democratization of basic services to alleviate people by giving them hope and opportunity from the poverty line. So if you look at the sustainable development goals, there are about 15 of them by the United Nations. Uh, you know, you can, you, know, you can find a clear line between AI and data and what can be achieved. And that's, you mentioned there a point that Anne mentioned in the chat a little while ago. Um, how do we use AI to bridge the gap between those in terms of the haves and the haves not um, mm -hmm. in terms of technology poverty? Because it is, you could perceive AI as very much, you know, just for those who are the, you know, the Western world, the haves, because, because of the investment dollars it requires. Well, I mean, that, that, would, that would be true only for certain things. So if you look at where the growth is happening, if you, it's actually happening largely in Asia and uh, Africa and the emerging market. So if that's the case, then a lot of companies in Asia and the US are actually trying to capitalize on the scale of these markets by lowering the cost of their services because they can't, nobody can afford them otherwise by using artificial intelligence. So if anything, there is a huge impetus to provide more and lower cost. And the only way to do it is through AI. So it's not like they're providing AI to them. They're providing services that have AI. On the other hand, if you're working on some orphan, you know, orphan disease drug where, and you're using AI, it's $1.2 million to get that drug because you hired um, AI researchers that cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. That is a problem. Uh, that we even face today, where when you have original research that is done uh, or something very expensive that is built, how do you bring down its cost over time? And ironically, that may also be uh, done by using artificial intelligence in the long run. So th thank you. I mean, so just, you know, we talked about a lot of um, d different companies and I guess, you know, industries at a high level. Um, Someone's mentioned in the chat about a com company like Tesla, you know, a company that's there perceived at the forefront of the electric vehicle world. What's your view on a company like Tesla or others around now? Are, are they truly at the forefront or do you see other companies that you would say, actually, you know, the, these new entrants are doing something really exciting in AI and that is something we should be looking to emulate? I think, I, I think Tesla is doing something amazing, but, you know, there are a lot of other areas, I think what excites me a lot is biomedical engineering, um, areas like digital therapeutics and areas like uh, natural language processing with uh, GPT-3, areas uh, in space, for example, nanotech. We don't really hear of these companies because they're still in their infancy. Food tech, for example, is becoming extremely important, like the Notco company. The fact that it's able to create plant-based food that's, um, that's as nutritious and tastes the same as milk, for example, by using, I think, cabbage and pineapple and some other ingredients. It could only do that kind of innovation by using uh, its AI chef called Giuseppe. So, you know, these are the kind of things where um, not only does it lead to a more sustainable planet, but they're truly innovative. It's just we always hear of the companies when they become super big or have a superstar yeah. in front of them. Um, but I, I do believe that in robotics, for example, a lot of the things that we've seen companies like Boston Dynamics do with their ability to walk, to do flips, to dance, that's incredible in biomechanical engineering. So we, and of course, it's all driven by AI, right? Because the software is all artificial intelligence and computer vision and all of that. Yeah. So I think that that will continue to be something that we'll see. Uh, personally, for myself, I'm very interested in in biotech, particularly in digital therapeutics and liquid biopsies, and in the ability of mRNA to do more in cancer. That's where I'm looking at, but 
there, there are many, many, many areas. Okay. So be, before we get more, I guess, into the governance and the ethics around AI, which we'll touch on very shortly, where do you see AI going, Aisha? Like, is it, are we going to be living among robots? Um, are we going to have robots ruling <laughs> over our lives? Where, where do you see it going in the next five years? Like in the next five years, certainly they will not become conscious. They won't be ruling over us. But I think in the next hundred years, um, AI will will become much more intelligent. Right now, it's not self-conscious. It's not even as intelligent as a two-year-old. It, it can't connect the dots for anything. Uh, it can do very narrow things, especially if they're routine or repetitive very, very well. You know, GPT-3 can actually write beautiful poetry and even articles that if you tell if you give it like three kinds mm -hmm. of authors as examples it's even written a sermon um, which sounded like the same priest that it was copying but it doesn't understand what it's doing and so what ai is trying to what ai researchers are now trying to do is trying to truly make it more human like by giving it kind of uh, by integrating it with neuroscience and trying some new kind of approaches to ai if any of those approaches come to fruition, we will see that AI will become um, more human-like. Again, it'll be different from us. But so at that point, it may become, uh, it may roam amongst us and we may take it a lot more seriously. Um, I still wouldn't recommend that we treat it as an equal ever. We should always be in a position of agency and power. But it is, as Sherry Turkle from MIT said, we are just, as human beings, we're hardwired. We see a puppy or a robot, if their peers the same, we just start to cuddle it. And I don't know if you've seen this Japanese robot called Lovot, L-O-V-O-T. It's just adorable. And the purpose of this Lovot is not to be efficient. It really doesn't, is of no help around the house. It just walks around and is like super cuddly and adorable. It looks like a little, like really cute little teddy bear. And um, so we will have robots fulfilling all kinds of functions around us. And um, they won't take over us, but the companies that own them, the individuals that own them, will actually have a lot of information about us. And we must prevent monopolies, like you know, a monopoly of, on you know, 80% of the household robots by, by, through mergers and acquisitions and other things that are happening. I think the governments will have to prevent that because that is when it gets dangerous. That's when we don't we have some like one person ruling over us. It's it's lovely to hear AI described as cute and adorable. I I haven't heard that before. <laughs> but, uh, I, where, but I just want to say this note: where where should a what should AI not replace? Where where are the hard lines? Okay, right now. And it may change anything that seriously affects uh, a person's life, whether it's a health decision or even a kill button even by a robot uh, army soldier, should have a human in the loop. However, we have heard, uh, and it's been in the news, that even the armies are now considering autonomous drones to make decisions themselves. So actually, we're kind of moving away from this. Uh, and in digital therapeutics, we're moving away from this, where we're letting the AI kind of calibrate your dosage. So then the question becomes, well, where do we stop? Um, I, I think that having uh, relationships with children or with people who are vulnerable, giving psychiatric advice, I'm very cautious about all of these things because they touch the human soul very deeply, our emotions. We're very vulnerable to being manipulated. I think we have to be very careful about these. Um, the other thing is, a good place to look at risks and how they should be regulated is the European Commission's latest guideline, where they have divided AI systems by a hierarchy of risk. So they've said that certain things like facial recognition algorithms and using them to make certain decisions about you, uh, they, they're just too high risk. So only maybe the governments will be allowed to use them. But in other things, uh, you know, such as whether um, they're giving you some book recommendations, well, that's low risk, that's okay. So, you know, we, we, it's just an initial guideline, but governments are beginning to think about this. So how should we regulate AI because of its huge influence on our decisions, uh, our everyday decisions? So we do have to have some boundaries, 
but those boundaries have to be based on the risk that they pose to our agency, to our ability to think for ourselves. Thank you, Aisha. Roland, I can see um, I can see you on camera, so I'm going to probably unfairly pick on you here. But I, I know you you've um, you've asked a question, or you and I spoke in the past about the impact of AI on job jobs and jobs. Do you want to just take that question directly to Aisha? Yeah, thank you, Aisha. This is really fascinating. You you do suggest that AI will just allow us to do the things that we want to do. Um, in other discussions, people have flagged that if it does result in high scale joblessness, that universal basic income could help address that. What do you think about UBI uh, in the future? I think it's important. Uh, you know, I think that it's uh, it's very important to help people transition from a world where they had job security to a world where some of their tasks and their jobs have been replaced by machines and to give them that bridge to find something else. The, in, in Singapore, there's somebody that I write about in my book. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of his. He's 67 years old, and he got laid off as an engineer for an aerospace company. And immediately, the government came in. They said, OK, you know what? These are your career options. Uh, given your background, let's talk about it. They gave him an internship with uh, a paid internship, they, the government paid, for 3D printing and manufacturing for a very large German company. He loves it. But of course, he doesn't know if he'll, it's very basic, he's learning, but his pay is going to be a lot less in the future. So this is the bigger problem. You might still find some jobs, but because you're, especially when you're older, the pay may be less. So there, there's all kinds of issues, like how long can the government keep funding that person then? Um, maybe it partially funds him and partially he has this other job. It's it's more important, I think, that we continue to find meaningful things for people to do than just to do cash handouts, because that is uh, when I see him, I see somebody who's still excited. Uh, plus, so so the way it should be, the the uh, it should be structured in a way that that helps the human spirit instead of just giving up cash handouts. I think Singapore is doing it in an interesting way, but hundred percent, you have to do it. You can't just let people suffer. This is no, this is disruptive, and it's our job, all of us, to help them. Do you, Do you see companies uh, subsidizing that through an AI tax or something? I don't. I well, I don't know. I don't see companies subsidizing that. But yeah, sure. If there was a government incentive, they'll do it. You know, um, it does fall on governments to do this, um, that because their interests are or should be at least completely citizen centric. Whereas companies are not employee centric, um, even though they should be. Some of the companies that we've worked with, they've actually come to us and said, look, can you give us some training, brainstorm with us what other things this person could do? And I really value that. That requires leadership that comes from the top and a decision. And, and it doesn't have to be so long, right? For some people, you can say, well, this person can do something else. And as they are migrating out of one job into another, um, you know, there can be very little, there can be some overlap. So the, the, so they're not just, the, the company's just not spending money on them. So we have to, we have to brainstorm. And I think that activist groups, nonprofit organizations, they have to keep highlighting that. We need to have this discussion. Um, this is a very important point that you raised. Thank you so much. Roland, very, very quickly, Roland, do you, do you agree with that? I think, well, I love the comment you made about, um, about us using this in a, in a meaningful way. It sort of gave me a vision of, of almost paying people to engage with old people, like multi-generational mm -hmm. um, interaction or art, singing, painting. <laughs> in a way it could make AI, it, it just, it's a future where humans could be more human and computers could be more robotic. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. And it should be that way, to be honest. They are we should not try to become like each other. Even though uh, it is a fact that we, we, a lot of us will become kind of cyborgish because we will start integrating those things in us. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not totally against that, frankly, either, because I don't know the, the calculus by which people make these decisions sometimes. Yeah. It may be very subtle. You know, it's so subtle. Could be like a laser, like we get LASIK. I got it to correct my vision. So now they can make me a little better. Like, is that? Bad? Like, where do you draw the line? To be That's honest? amazing.
So we, yeah. have, so we uh, don't, we, we just have to not be judgmental, but have a way of thinking about it, you know? Uh, Aisha, I'm going to move us on slightly because we're running out of time and there's so much to cover oh, okay. here. We yes. haven't done everything, but I'm... <laughs> But I did want to ask you, because it's come up a couple of times about how you have empowered women in this space and diversity in this space. Yes. Um, you've got your charity, 21st Century Girls. Tell us a little bit about that and how, you know, some of the challenges you've seen and what you've done to address those, to empower those, you know, and to create diversity in the in the AI space. This is something so close to my heart. Thank you for asking about this. Um, I have been in technology for like 100 years, but uh, I'm very often one of the few technical women that sit on boards or in senior meetings, and I miss that. I feel that it actually leads to poorer decisions when we don't have diversity. Um, I'm interested in girls in tech, but that is as true of minorities. That is as true of any kind of minority, whether it's uh, sex or gender or race or even age. Um, I, I dislike the ageism that sometimes we see in tech as well. So for me, I wanted to empower girls so that when they sit in a meeting, and people are talking about AI and robots, even though that's not their passion or their core interest, they're very comfortable. They know the basics, they are debating it, they're critical about it. That was important to me. Um, and so I created some courses, first for youngsters, uh, where Google and, and the government kind of participated as well. And we've taught thousands of kids coding in Singapore. But then I created one for teenage girls, um, and they're learning the basics of AI. And they do three things. They literally learn how to code and how to do um, you know, random forest trees and, and neural networks and algorithms. Then they connect business problems to AI algorithms. So they understand how to solve them. It's, an, it's a practical application. And finally, we just debate ethics. Um, and talk about it. It's just very important. For me, when it's not so important where you are, especially when you're young, you may change your opinion over time, but that you ask the question constantly of yourself and your team, that's very healthy. So this has been going on as we have five runs. We're now digitizing the course. So it can be available for everyone. And, and, and it's had a great response. Basically, people have uh, said they feel more confident afterwards about their future. And that was my goal not to make them techies, but to make them more confident. So, so what would your message be then here, Aisha, to everyone here on this forum to empower everyone, let's say, and not, you know, your, your 21st century girls, but everyone in AI, those people who are nervous about it, what steps can people take to embrace it? Well, look, I think that the, the important thing is to get in the mindset, right? To get in the flow. And the easiest way to get in the flow is literally to put a Google alert. You put a Google alert, take something that you love. It could be food, it could be, uh, you know, flying, whatever. Put uh, food, tech, plus AI. And then you'll just start getting those alerts. Mostly they're about startups. Um, and sometimes they're about regulation. And every day you read it. I just tell you, just read it for a month, every day, uh, with your cup of coffee. And then you'll just get in the zone. And then after that, start reading, um, you know, MIT Technology Review is fantastic, especially because they're very balanced about these things. Um, and then you just, that's it. You don't need to be overwhelmed with information. And after that, once things really open up, maybe attend a meetup now and then. Maybe you say, I want meetup a, a month. And this is how slowly within six months, you'll see that you'll just become comfortable. You'll start to connect the dots between what you're reading and after that, it's your decision. You could say, well, now I think I'll take kind of an AI course, like AI for Everyone by Andrew Ng, fantastic introduction, or maybe a more serious course. So I think that's how I would kind of go about it. No, I should, it, it, that's fantastic. And look, I put I put in the chat your 21st Century Girl um, website so people can oh, see thank that. thank you. Really, really lovely to hear from you. Thank you so much. It's been a really inspiring morning. And I think, you know, a lot of people will take so many, so many messages from that. And um, you've unpacked our AI in a very, in a lovely way for everyone. So thank you so, so very much. Um, so that's it, thank everyone. Thank you so much um, for having me. <laughs> We're going to draw things to a close. Thank you all very much for attending. Hopefully I got to your question. Um, you can, you can listen again on our website. Um, this, the video of this will be posted on our website very soon and please share with your friends and contacts.
Um, we have our last uh, forum of the series next week, so please come along to us um, when we'll be looking at the future of work and the future of the office and bringing together the threads we've had with some star-studded guests to lead the discussion. So until next week, um, on behalf of my opportunity and Robert Half team here today, I'd like to extend our best wishes to you all. Thank you all for coming. Stay safe, be bold, be kind to each other, use AI, and um, we look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.